Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Doctor is in, and today Lovedy is joining me once again for this second game of the series. It is, again, against all odds on the blue side, facing off against Bring Back Dominion, who has a one lead, one game lead on the red side. Wait, they are the... Which team won? Yeah, bring back the minion one. That's okay, okay, yeah. Okay, no, no, no. I'm just making <laughs> sure. I, I could have sworn the other... We had them swapped around again. All right. Well, that's fine. All right. So, yeah, we, we're going into game two now. They had a very decisive lead after they managed to get a couple good team fight wins. Uh... They managed to capitalize on a few mistakes going into that corridor against the team with Nunu and Galio. Just never a really good idea. Yeah, Galio is a little silly right now. Obviously, he can be beaten, and he does have, you know, things that can go wrong when you play him. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's not really strong. Yeah, they're going to be banning away the Galio and then the Riven once again. Uh, now a third top lane ban as well. They really want to heavily target this top lane matchup. Three top lane bans to start off. Uh, the Lucian's being banned away. They definitely don't want to have to deal with that mid lane matchup again. Ivorin going to be first picked. Uh, I'm surprised he managed to actually make it through, especially with what the last two jungle picks were. You could definitely expect at least one of these two junglers to be willing to play the Ivern. Gangplank is getting hovered right now. Uh, not quite sure if they're going to be blind picking that. No. Yeah. Going to be a Gragas instead. The Ivern is something that's a little interesting to me in itself because I feel like Ivern just isn't that strong comparative to other junglers at the moment. I mean, you know, we saw last game we had the Nunu versus... Um, The Nunu versus the Zack. Yeah, the Zack. Uh, All right. Well, who is actually still up, by the way? Zack is still an option, but with the Ivern pick, you know, we can see that Bring Back Dominion simply doesn't have to worry about a jungler just yet. Now, you can see the priorities have shifted as well. Uh, Bring Back Dominion have decided to pick up their support in the first rotation, something they did not do last game. They saw that the Ivern had been first picked. They realized, wait, uh, they might be trying to build some kind of composition around Chaos. Chaos did have a very decent game on the vein last game. And although he was caught out a couple of times in team fights, he definitely was a very threatening champion by the end of that game. And uh, if he had given, been given a little bit more opportunity to really shine, there was a possibility that he might have been able to shift the game in their favor. They decided to pick up the Lulu to kind of counter that. You definitely don't want to be giving away Ivern and Lulu at the same time. But instead, we're still going to see Oriana and Karma picked up as well. So now I'm a little curious about the Fiora ban. I mean, Big Fantastic didn't exactly have the best game on the Fiora. But now you already see the makings of a particular AD carry comp. You have Ivern, Ori, Karma. Why wouldn't you just continue banning out 80 carries? It might just be that they realize now they've given away three of some of the strongest supportive type champions. What they really want to do is they want to force Bacon-tastic onto something that he's really not comfortable on. They, uh, we might even see one last top lane ban. I'm not entirely sure, but it's very possible. They want to force him onto something he's uncomfortable on and kind of crush that top part of the map. Oh, they do ban away the vein. They do feel like Chaos might be picking that into his Protect the ADC comp. But what they really want to do is... Uh, there's not a really a front line. In these kind of compositions, the front line's always going to be the top laner. That's going to be the person that's standing in front of everyone else. Ivern's not really much of a tank on his own, especially with his preferred build. So it's all up to whatever the top lane picks instead. With a bunch of top lane bans targeted towards Bacon-tastic, they feel like they could really exploit that part of the map. Especially considering last game, he got the Fiora versus Galio matchup, and he really uh, fluffed it up too much. and. They, they feel like they can exploit that once again for this matchup as well. So with that Warwick lock-in, it's almost it's basically guaranteed that Zack will not be picked or banned this game. It's a little, a little weird. It also means that's a blind pick Gragas top. They really want to get this AD carry pick last. Uh, Nar is going to be locked in. Not necessarily the most traditional frontline in the world, but... 
kind of a little hybrid between the AD cannon that's been popularized and a frontline tank. Uh, they maybe feel that Nar can provide a little bit of the playmaking they might need. He's definitely got peel. Something that a lot of people don't use with Nar's ultimate is uh, using it as a peeling tool instead of an initiation tool. They might decide to do that instead. Jinx is being locked in as well. So we're going to have the immobile, uh, heavily favoring late game ABC Jinx. And now with the Lulu already locked in, we're going to see what kind of AD carry Bring Back Dominion might pick to try and really stomp that lane out. So and I, would, I actually like this a lot. I wouldn't have been surprised to see the Draven come back, um, just because it you know worked so well last time, and you're basically getting the same um, lineup, just replacing the Thresh with the Karma. Um, but looking at these two drafts, I can't help but think that Bring Back Dominion won a little bit. Yeah, I definitely like the draft a lot. It's a protect the ADC comp, but really their front line on against all odds is very unreliable. He had a shaky first game, so we can expect to uh, to maybe see some of that shakiness still available. Unless he he has nerves of steel, I can imagine that he's still going to have in his mind a couple of the solo kills that happened the game beforehand, and he's not exactly the most reliable top laner in the world anyway. With the way the rage bar interacts, with how quickly it builds up, and then how even quicker how it drains down after he transforms, he's just not going to be a front line you can really play around most of the time. And uh, at the same time, what Kogma is initially not necessarily the, the strongest laner in the world, right? He's immobile. Once he hits level 6 is when he really starts to deal a ton of damage uh, with execution-wise, with his percentage missing HP on his ultimate, his living artillery. His W and his Q both require a lot of levels in it before they really start giving him scaling when he starts doing the HP damage with his increased range. And when he starts getting the Caustic Spittle, uh, some extra levels is when he gets that increased attack speed that he's really known for, that machine gun Kogma. But what really complements this lane and what transforms him from a scaling ADC into a very scary laning one is this Lulu being picked up early. Once Lulu drops that E onto the Kogma, adds that little bit of extra on-hit damage with the picks, this becomes a very scary duo and something that, not, that Jinx really can't uh, abuse or avoid really early on. Although Jinx does have the increased range on her fish bones, she doesn't exactly have a range advantage over the Kogma. And every time she's going to be going in for all these auto trades, we can expect Kogma and Lulu to be firing back. And I like that. It's it's not only a composition that can kind of draft it around the whole protect the ADC, wanted a lot of scaling as well. Victor's not considered much of a lane bully anymore, along with the nerfs that he's received over the years. And Kogma at the same time wants a few items, but these are both champions that can survive the laning phase and in Kogma's case, even abuse the Jinx scaling early on. Jinx Kogma is something I actually really like to watch too. I mean, yes, I could do without the Lulu and the Karma, just very boring supports I find but the, the Kogma Jinx matchup is actually a lot of fun to play um, because Jinx can get a little abusive early on but the Kogma just has so many tools options kind of in the early game to really work around it and try and get some trade damage back and the image I really like to paint for things like the Kogma Jinx to immobile carries is uh, try to imagine a fencing match where it's just this constant walking back and forth. There's no dashes or tumbles or anything like that that can really shift where uh, how the action might be unfolding. What this entirely depends on, especially with Lulu and Karma, they don't provide anything but movement speed boosts on their own as well, is really this Kogma and this Jinx's footwork. Uh, to quote the double lift meme, the auto spacing that both of these AD carries can utilize to their fullest effect. If they can complete that dance correctly, kind of weave in autos and immediately back away to safety as well, whichever one of these two AD ADCs that can complete that uh, more quickly and more efficiently, you can definitely start to see that, that lane skew in their favor. And I'm also curious to see what kind of build we're going to be seeing from this Kogma. Um, I would expect Blade of Their Own King into Hurricane, um, but you know, in the past we've seen Trinity Force, we've seen uh, Infinity Edge, we've seen um, 
I mean, we haven't seen Death Dance yet, but we might actually see that because um, that would that would be a pretty good pickup. Um, Possible to see maybe a Rage Blade or something. Rem I reminder that, that one, yeah. Death Dance is not Spell Vamp. Death Dance is entirely unique in its own class. It's Life Steal that's only given on physical damage, auto attacks, and spells. So that's why if you were to auto attack with a Death Dance on Corky, you'd only be getting 20% of the healing on your auto attacks as well. And so considering a lot of Kogma's kit is magic damage, I don't believe we're going to be seeing a Death Dance. It's possible, but at the same time, it's much more likely we'll be getting the support equivalent of the death stance right now the ardent sensor for this lulu uh, ardent sensor is something that kogmas love to use they get that increased attack speed and of course all the healing means that they can keep themselves topped off basically all the time on hp uh, getting into the game now we're starting to see summoner spells and masteries what i find interesting is we have uh, deathfire grasp for the victor Something we haven't seen very much of in general. We have seen uh, a majority of victors go Thunderlords, and then with the Thunderlords changes, uh, Storm Raiders, but not really much Deathfire, uh, Deathfire Grasp. I mean, Deathfire we, Grasp we saw touch. this last night where we saw the the uh, actually Brandwin Thunderlords instead Thunderlords, of Deathfire, yeah. uh, which is what you were talking about there. It's very interesting. He's not necessarily a dot champion. I mean, he does have multiple ticks on two of his abilities. Both his Chaos Storm and his, laser, his uh, Death Ray do both have secondary ticks of damage, right? So you can apply the Death Fire touch multiple times, but at the same time, it's a little unreliable. Uh, surprising to see him go for both the Teleport and the Death Fire touch. That's a very immobile victor. Something that might be able to uh, be abused once team fights come around. You could definitely see maybe Ivern going in for a Root early on with no ghost or cleanse available to the victor he's going to be very vulnerable early on in the game might be abused uh, in the top lane we have oh, okay we have uh, pause in the meantime we can talk a little bit about masteries some more uh, with victor d sing nar did take the Grasp of the undying in the top lane as well that's very interesting to me specifically because you think Nar into the Grogus matchup, that's not something that he really has to worry about. Yes, Grogus does hurt like hell when he actually gets up in your face, but Nars excels at really abusing those top lane matchups while also feeling relatively safe. I mean, he does have his hop if he ever really does need to get away, and Body Slam is not necessarily a long enough range to where that should matter. Uh, so going for the Grasp instead of the Fervor shows that he really doesn't feel too much confidence in bullying this Grogus instead. He just wants to survive. Yeah, now there's something that's really odd to me, because um, we're still seeing it played in EU LCS, which is weird, um, but that's that's because he used a Fiesta. Um, but it's, like you mentioned earlier, it's almost kind of like why we're seeing the Kennen. You know, you build kind of a weird-ish style build and then you know you just split push into oblivion so it, it's that's why it's being picked but it, it's interesting to see that it, it's actually still a thing because it's, it's it's gonna be interesting it's just very surprising to me it seems like they kind of for they, they had an idea with the rest of the composition and once they came to bake and task it Fantastic. Once they knew that was a Gragas top lane, he kind of just decided, well, I'm just going to go for something a little more comfortable for me. I'd rather just play this Gnar and uh, just kind of play my own kind of game. So he picks the Grasp of the Undying, which, of course, you could take on other tank top laners and do just as well. But he doesn't take the fervor of battle on what's essentially a lane bully. He, It's like he didn't want to commit to one of the two really popular styles of top laner right now. He didn't want to commit to damage. I mean, he still had the rumble available to him. There was still AD Kennen as well if he wanted to go that gnar kind of style. Yet in the end, he uh, wound up going for this kind of hybrid gnar, and I don't know. It's I mean, you, you strange. do get the best of both worlds with that gnar pickup because you you do get the damage and you can get you know a little tanky. It's not you know this or that. It's not either or. It's you know, you can get those ranged auto attacks if you do end up losing, you know, like if you get body slammed into oblivion right off the bat, then you can, you know, save up to Meganar and get a little bit of a heal there. 
Right, and it's just going to be dependent on just how reliable this NAR can be with his transformations. We're already seeing in the bottom lane. Level 1, the, the combination of both Pix and Kogma's W is a very potent combo. We're already having uh, Karma take a ton of damage just from a little bit of poke. Which is odd, because normally it's Karma that's doing the poking. I, I mean, Karma's one of the most unfun bottom lane matchups you can get. But, you know, those Lulu's doing a good job putting the shield onto AD Carry is boring. And oh, that's a DC again. That is a second... Uh, maybe it's just a lag oh, he's, spike. He's definitely lagging. Definitely recovered there a little bit. Yep. This time, that's where you want to get your lag spike, not an, under the enemy tower. Alright, I mean, I don't know if you'd want to get a lag spike anywhere, but yes, it's definitely preferable to be closer to your tower for it. And, uh, an added side effect of, you know, bringing that Pix to the Kog'Maw is, of course, it provides a nice hefty little shield as well. Uh, oh, missed the cannon, but, uh, it's definitely a nice shield that is almost always maxed by Lulu's now since the changes to her kit to ensure she's no longer played in solo lanes. So having that being maxed first means it might cover a few mistakes or latency uh, issues that might be happening in the bottom lane. Yeah, I mean the new wind speakers is pretty nice too, plus you know we have the Arden sensor, we have uh, the new Zeke's Herald actually, which maybe we'll see it once again, we saw it last night. Yeah, I'd be interested to see it. Uh oh, we have our first gank in the Mid lane here, that movement speed already. Ivern is there though, waiting the bushes, gets the root collar, but that's where it ends. And just to escape without having to burn anything, but that does pressure her out of the lane already, and she's already got no potions left, so she's already been harassed a decent amount by the victor early on in this lane. Oh, a meeting. Ooh, Reaver finding Questionized. Ivern does not win that 1v1. Yeah, I was going to say, Questionized doesn't want to be here. He does get help, but he will be going down for first blood. This should be a trade kill if Bacon just fights this out. Ah, that was not yeah. where you wanted to bounce to. I saw the thought process grinding out in his brain there, but unfortunately, bouncing into the enemy top laner is... is for certain death, and that makes that lane really difficult for Bacon Fastwick now. I mean, that was possibly the worst thing he could have done. They both died with their flash available, and he knew that there was not going to be any mid lane help coming in. Victor was busy in the mid lane, and he decides to jump towards the opposite direction instead. And uh, it's just another mechanical error. Like like I said before. In the game beforehand, he, he did start to have a little bit of nerves after oh, missing out on a couple solo kills. In. Ooh, the root collar catches the minion. We get a flash out of rainbows. The polymorph. Oh, so very close. But now Chaos is on the run. One more auto coming out of rainbows. The Warwick's on the top side of the map, however. So even though he's quick, he's not that quick. And again, it seems like he's just not that comfortable on the Ivern, maybe. He he throws the root way too early, just collides with a minion. He walks forward anyway, despite missing the Q. Takes a ton of damage. He might just think he's tankier than he actually is. Yeah, I mean, we see that all of the time currently with Rakans, is they'll dive in thinking they're like a tank support, and then they just get shredded. Um, Ivern does kind of have the same feel, because, you know, he you can get in there very quickly with his root collar and you know come two items he does feel very tanky oh i mean remember like we saw in the series yesterday just build a zonia zomrakan if you don't feel that tanky please no <laughs> I, I would much rather see you know the new Zeke's. I, I would actually like to see a lot more of the new Zeke's. I think it's an interesting item, and if it does end up working out, we'll see a lot more interesting items in the future. Surprisingly, we do see that uh, R actually has retained a CS lead despite dying early on, and he also has an XP lead on top of it, managing to hit 6 way before Gragas will. The problem and, um, is, the, the Narbar is so not there that I don't think it's going to come into play. Yeah, there it is. There's level 6 for Roxas. 
Right, and important to keep in mind as well, something I didn't mention before, another reason why the Grasp of Undying is so unusual for the Gnar, ever since the 1v1 tournament that happened last year, oh, another gank in the mid lane. Gank in the mid lane, question I see, he's gonna land the root, the Shockwave nice gets flash. flashed, however, the dragon goes over to red side, now Roxas just throws out the explosive barrel, it sends the mid laner back to safety. Question eyes though. Meets an angry doggo. But meanwhile, oh, they don't, the doggo, they don't win that. They don't win that 2v2. The pugger in the bottom lane is winning this fight. The exhaust is there, but the level six is not. Oh no! The flash is available for Bacon Tastic, but now he's gonna be running into the enemy bottom lane. Not quite sure what the thought process was there. AD carry is boring, wins the 1v2 in the bottom lane as well. Now Chaos is on the run, but no one's there to pick up the kill. And I'm, I, I don't know what Baking Tastic was thinking there. They're just not playing to their strengths. They they're want to scale up, they want to get a couple items, and then they want to just build around this Jinx. There's no reason to start getting aggressive with these teleports. You only use those teleports to save your allies. You don't TP with Meganar available, trying to t trying to turn around some kind of dragon fight. That was the original intention. They wanted to try and stop the Infernal Drake from being taken. Instead, they get into a 2v2 skirmish by the Tribrush in the bottom lane. Nar TPs into the middle of two different separate fights. What is that? Okay. Uh, you can just smite that, buddy. Now I'll all right. <laughs> I, I understand the thought process there, but it, it was just gone way too quick for the Ivern's <laughs> channel to finish. But Bacontastic now, he's just in such a bad spot. But as I was saying before, this Grasp of the Undying is just going to become worse and worse because the effect is halved for ranged champions. Oh, he's got a Mega Nar. The Nar is not going to come Anar out though. just yet. Oh man, he's got the flash. He's gonna try to go for the flash over the wall. And he gets he's gonna it. get out. Feels bad, man. And that all started. Oh man, they definitely could have finished off that kill if they had covered their options a little bit more. But uh, they they basically assumed that kill was secured. Uh oh, Warwick. Reaver, he has red buff. I think he should be fine. But his here. ultimate. Yeah, there's no blast cone here, but I think he can just block it out. Does get knocked up. Oriana's here, but Roxas and oh, I'm here to have that was an aggressive quick call. On response. Now Oriana's cut off from the rest of the team. On fight, but meanwhile, there's Harry's no flash. There's no flash. Oh, just auto attack after auto attack, and the living artillery is enough to finish it off. Which actually is the bio can barrage that finished it. Excuse me. I love uh, what they're winding up doing with this composition. Uh, just I hate look the at skin, the by the way. Oh, <laughs> like I love the like... skin, but I hate the skin. You don't like the Borks, huh? Oh, that might be a solo kill. Another sombrero coming in. I'm here to have fun. I'm just gonna. He could have actually probably killed Questionable there. In all honesty, I think his death ray hey. was available, which would have gotten him the kill. But we can see uh, with all this going on, all these resources that have been devoted to the mid and top lane instead, they're completely ignoring why they made this comp in the first place. They're just letting the Jinx get bullied. Look at the Kogma's build. He goes for tier 2 boots first, and I love that so much. Because when you get sped up by the Lulu, when you see that this Jinx, of course she's going to want to buy bigger items first. She doesn't want to spend gold and time buying tier 2 boots. She's absolutely going to be slower than the Lulu Kogma combo that enables the Kogma who knows he wins that 2v2 they don't know to just... here. Uh -oh. oh that Depression was blind too in, very nice played. no flash yet still no flash which means killing spree for Reaver they're just not devoting any resources to the bottom lane. The first time we see Ivern come bot, he says hello and immediately leaves. Now he look he's in the top side of the jungle again looking to counter jungle Krugs well, to be fair, like, there's nothing there. Like, the Krugs is unfortunate because you don't get as much gold from the Krugs as Ivern because you don't get to kill all the little ones. Believe. Could be wrong on that one.
and that's first tower going down as well. I love the read they had as well. They saw, that's one of the issues with Ivern giving away his buff. Normally, the whole idea of after level five, oh, you know, Ivern being able to donate buffs and also take them at the oh, same time. The Root's gonna land. gonna land. RKO gets stunned though. Uh oh. The double shield is enough to survive for now, however. Stuns going back and forth in the top lane. Roxas gets a little grasped. Oh no, Reaver gets the follow but they're not close enough to follow up on the back end. All they're doing is they're stretching the team thin again. That m was a little bit of a strange... Uh, oh, that's that's a dead. Gank. Uh, nope, oh. that's going to be flashes. They managed to stretch everyone thin. Jinx wants to get the farm. She wants to catch the safe wave bottom lane, but now they need wave clear mid lane. Ivern and uh, Oriana have to back. They can pressure whatever the hell they want. 30 seconds on the Drake. Pre pushes in every single lane. They've just got complete control of the game. And if you're wondering why the Jinx was caught out earlier by the Warwick, this is one of the issues with the Ivern. Normally you'd consider, okay, post level 5 I get every single buff for myself and for one of my teammates. The only problem is that's projected to the enemy team as well. They know that people are going to want to pick up those red and blue buffs, and they played around it perfectly. Warwick comes bottom lane when he knows Jinx is going to complete a wave and go for that red buff, and he manages to not only capitalize it on it by killing her when she has no sums, she doesn't even manage to grab the red buff for herself. It disappeared by the time she could really get back and secure it, and that's just taking, a uh, taking away another one of the strengths that Ivern provides for his team. So one thing I like there, as we saw AD Carry in the um, Dragon Pit, is he cleared the ward, which, you know, typically you see a lot of people do in solo queue. But one thing to note is if there's a control ward and your regular ward is disabled, there's no vision being granted there. So you don't have to kill it, because once you start killing it, then you give vision over to the enemy team. But what Edie Carey did there is he removed the teleport threat. So now you don't necessarily have to worry about Bacon Tasket teleporting to that ward, but you also know that there's no vision. So like right now, there's no vision here. They don't know how low the dragon was. But oh, that was a slightly bad smite, but they wind up securing it. 9 HP. But yes, like you said, the only reason to not clear a ward is... Uh, when you don't want to give away vision, especially when you're trying to sneak something. But otherwise, yes, I mean, they were still prepping beforehand. No reason not to take that little bit of gold and XP as well. We know that Gragas is still matching the Gnar in the top lane, going to make sure he's not going anywhere, and very safe dragon take for the most part. Just slightly whip. But I still have people pinging disabled wards, asking me to clear it instead of just running through it. It's a little... That part's a little aggravating, not gonna lie. I mean, I, I, I almost never want to pass up on the uh, golden XP they do wind up providing, but it also depends on where exactly the ward might be. The situation, like right there, clearing the wards in the dragon pit, very safe option. Surrounded by the team, you know that the, a lot of the enemy team is either backed off or in lanes. You have no worry of be, really being counterattacked while clearing the vision. At the same time, if you're moving through the enemy jungle and you find a pink ward in the middle there, you have no idea where the rest of the team is, like we saw in the last game with the Nunu invades. Just leave the pink ward. You have the knowledge, you know that the pink ward's there, now play around it instead of trying to clear it instead. Four auto attacks is a hell of a time to take clearing wards and Ooh, we got Daisy some fancy feet on Victor. Caller. Victor's just getting annihilated here. The damage isn't quite there. The Super Mega Death Rocket isn't enough with the execution. Now that AD Carry is boring, has showed up. The Flash 3-man oh, yeah. Body Slam! Holy moly! They get the Explosive Cask. It's not enough to keep him alive. Ivern in the back end, though, goes down. They do end up trading one for one. Bacon Tastic is here. Mini Nar. But the Mega Nar comes out with the four man Nar into the two man Shockwave. Three members down. Double kill for the Jinx. LG Chaos still alive with the double kill for AD Carry is boring as well. Reaver should be picking up this kill. They give it over to I'm here to have fun. They get one tower. They should get two. And that's the issue. The execution was there this time, but once again, not a clear shot caller. 
Oriana was not ready with her shockwave for when Narn came by with the flank ultimate, and they don't wind up catching out as many people as they would have liked. That was the opportunity to turn the fight. If Jinx still has her super mega death rocket available, instead of trying to go for that early kill, they wind up acing the team, and maybe they start coming back into the game. But without a clear game plan and without a clear shot calling leader to really help drive home what they need to be doing, they wind up taking what was potentially a game saving fight and turning it into just another two for four, one for four, three for four. Now, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on this current Ivern build that we see here. Completely rushed the redemption. But what we've been seeing competitively is more of a sight stone rush. And that's, uh, I, I don't like it because look at what trinket he has to take instead. He's really forced to make a decision between do I want to control vision or place vision with no smite stone available with still having the yellow trinket instead. That's just such a limited amount of vision that yes, I, I do think that getting at least the smite stone if not the sight stone is required to play Ivern. You need to constantly keep that vision around and in essence they really they they had a game plan and they decided to throw it away as soon as they loaded into the game so it's not too surprising to see that result we're gonna have fun gets the vision ward and he's able to put out a good chunk of damage there onto rko but with tp being burned in the top lane they're gonna have roxas on a sizable tp advantage too yeah, uh, with that last play, that definitely sucked a lot of the life out of Against All Odds. They are now down uh, essentially 8,000 gold. They have lost several towers. They've lost control of the map. They don't have nearly as much vision as they would like. Uh, they're crowding around the Baron now, and they've actually started it. The rest of Against All Odds are trying... Oh, it's not even a Baron yet. Right, Gerald. <laughs> Daisy Damn. comes out. Shorter game than I thought. Jump in from Reaver, though, gets Ooh, the two-man three -man stun. Huge wild growth into the oh, Chaos man. Storm. Damage is a plenty. Double kill. Ace coming in. No, it's not an Ace. There's no Jinx. Excuse me. Four, that four, was zero. beautiful. They managed to do everything correctly to not only secure the Rift Herald, but absolutely devastate that team fight. Meganar's coming in. You know he wants to go in for that charge. Everyone's already around the wall anyway. It's a perfect opportunity. Warwick goes in, uses his infinite duress, and immediately suppresses the Nar. With no way to disrupt that Warwick ulti, Nar's just going to go down without ever using a spell. The rest of the team gets destroyed by the AoE. We've already got the Hurricane on the Kogma. He's dealing tons of damage. J Jinx isn't even able to really get into the fight. Seeing her team get blown up right away and Listen, that's essentially how we can expect every every fight yeah, yeah every <laughs> fight to go from now on they're just not playing around what their comp strengths are it's already a two item kogma which is insane like that fight could have been entirely different had that hurricane not been completed it probably wouldn't have because the the uh, victor is doing so much damage but you know not having your Kogma just absolutely shred multiple targets at once, maybe that turns out a little different. I don't know if I like this Sunfire first on Gragas. I feel like it's more like a cop-out, kind of just building what he's comfortable with. If he really wanted to be the ultimate tanky kind of a champion that he wants to be for this front line, he would have gone with the Frozen Heart Rush, which would have devastated the already behind Jinx. The Sunfire Cape, it's not really doing much. Nar's not doing his job split pushing efficiently anyway. You don't really need the extra damage from pushing that you get for that Sunfire Cape. Not only that, had he gone the triple Doran's route originally, which he actually only picked up the single Doran. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, had he gone the, the triple Doran route, um, he might have had the same amount of split pushing as the so Sunfire without having to rush it so much. He could have gotten that Frozen Heart into um, what we're seeing now, which is probably going to be the Spirit Visage. And it would have decimated the Gnar, it would have decimated the Jinx. It would have, it would have made life very difficult for against all odds. Right, but again, these are just kind of nitpicky, small, minor things. Doesn't make a huge difference. It's just more on a... a the idea of efficiency and what would have worked out best to keep this ball rolling. 
We do see a Baron's being attempted right now on the top side. They have no idea with two people splitting bottom as well. Jinx is backing Nars in the bottom side with no Oh, TP. they notice it now. They notice it now, but it is half gone. TP is now available, but the Mega Nar is not. Uh-oh. Actually, there's still no TP. The ball goes They're double TPing right Arcane. in front of the Gnar. They know there's no way he can stop it. We jump in. Reaver gets knocked up and taken low. But now Roxas is here. Explosive cast is going to miss, but it doesn't matter. Double oh, kills for Gragas. LG Chaos is going to go down in the end. So it's a double-double to bring that back Dominion. was absolutely beautiful. I love what they did. First, they bait the Baron. They go bottom lane. They send both their teleports to the bottom lane because they know Nar will feel compelled to stay and meet them there. Then they wait for the Mega Nar to go down and they call for an engage. They know once he's gone down to Mini Nar again, there's absolutely no way he can stop either of their teleports. He has no Cecile available and he's forced to use his Mega Nar. He's going to be exhausted. TPing will do nothing at that point. He's just going to be a Mini Nar running in to die with the rest of his team perfectly executed their timing was flawless and they managed to not only get four kills but get the baron and almost guarantee the second victory for game two yeah there's not a lot of wave cleared available just yet yes we have the hurricane completed on the jinx but there's only a bf pickaxe backing it there's no infinity edge yet so it's limited wave clear to say the least the oriana is in a fairly okay position that red buff, however, is not, and now neither is questionized. Bio Arcane Barrage, not quite enough. That's a large shield on Roxas right now, from in, coming from that Courage. Important to keep note also that shield gets bigger and bigger with each uh, enemy member that's nearby, so for these forced 5v5 fights now we can expect that shield to stay pretty big when he goes in for those engages and this should be the inhibitor they don't really have any option to defend it Roxas is feeling oh bold my. but there's chaos getting knocked in deleted big fantastic whiffs the nar fleeing is the rest of against all odds but everybody is going down double kill for the victor so, I'm having fun, clearly having fun. And yeah, Nar is uh, trying to escape. He's getting chased down right now. He's taking a little bit of damage from those caster minions too. He's just gonna die to minions. No cannon, no cannon! Does get executed though, so there is that. But in the end, just yeah, like this... the song, it doesn't even matter. That is game two going over to bring back the minion. An absolutely devastating game, too. Just from beginning to end, Dominion knew what their game plan was. They had the pressure exactly where it needed to be, and they finished off the game without a single mistake, managing to absolutely control this game from start to finish. Yeah, this game was pretty one-sided compared to the last one. Um, so I'm not really... I'm a little surprised because the game one was actually pretty close um, and you know they made some changes to their draft like we suggested but it seems like it might not have been enough yeah, it's just uh the idea was there in champion select but as soon as they rolled in the game they decided against actually trying to play to their strengths and hopefully this is something that can be cleaned up in later weeks but they definitely need to figure out who their shot caller is and what their game plans are going to be if they want to have any success in the future. Yeah, one thing newer teams sometimes suscept to is that even if you have a shot caller, they don't exactly listen to it. Like when you have a singular shot caller, yeah, you can have a sub shot caller, but there's arguments that that doesn't actually do anything. But if you have a main shot caller, if they say, if they make a call, all five members have to commit to that call. There is nothing worse than splitting a call. Yeah. And of course, it's impossible to know without actually hearing the comms ourselves, but uh, either way, so, definitely not a no, clean game, too, from them. Nar actually did the most damage on their team. So while the Nar pick was 1 5 and 1, it's still a little bit better than what we saw last game. Right. But 
that is a 2-0 series for Bring Back Dominion, guys. So with that, that is all the League of Legends we have for you today. Um, if you want to get involved with Ascension Esports and be in these Phoenix Leagues or the Elder Leagues or the Dragon Leagues, definitely hit us up on Twitter, on Reddit, on Discord. Um, we have our in-houses that we host daily, and obviously we enjoy having more people in the community. We're a great bunch of guys. But that being said, that's all we got for you today. I'm Doctor, being joined by Love D. Uh, have a good night, everyone, or a good afternoon, I guess. Happy Father's Day. That, yeah. But again, guys, thank you everyone for watching, and see you next time.